Richard Prosser. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and um, what a pleasure it is to uh, rise and, and take a call on this uh, de uh, debate in reply to the Prime Minister's statement to make my first contribution for this year. And I would like to extend uh, a, very, a very hearty Happy New Year to you, sir. Uh, and I will uh, undertake now uh, with witnesses to do my very utmost to make sure that you do manage to keep your New Year's resolution, sir. Um, well, honestly, uh, Mr Speaker, what, what a load of, of sycophantic rubbish um, we have heard spouted uh, over, the, over these last couple of days, uh, really from, from both sides of the House, um, <coughs> about the, uh, the new Prime Minister and, and uh, how wonderfully he's doing and how wonderfully he's going to do and, and, and so forth. Um, in actual fact, I have to admit, Mr Speaker, I was quite looking forward uh, to Bill English's first speech as Prime Minister because um, I, I've always had this... I found that Mr English's speeches as... Minister of Finance have this particular soporific effect on me. Um, he gets started and then a few bars in, uh, I find myself drifting off to sleep. So I was quite impressed um, when he first got started that he was, he was actually quite, quite animated. Um, he was uh, really quite excited and, and using expression and, um, and gesticulating. Um, and uh, you can look that word up, Mr Bennett, it's not what you think it is. Um, but shortly thereafter, uh, he, he sort of uh, reverted to type and, and um, the next thing I knew, my colleague Clayton Mitchell, who was sitting next to me, was elbowing me in the ribs and the, um, the, the familiar uh, waft of uh, verbal chloroform had come over me and, and, and away I'd gone. Um, <clears throat> so it appears that uh, Cruzy Bill, as uh, Labor seemed to have dubbed him, um, is, is no more exciting as uh, Snoozy Bill, who used to put me to sleep, Mr Speaker. And I, I actually have a copy of the, uh, of, of the speech that he gave here, Mr Speaker, and I was here listening to it when he gave it, but having sat through it, listened to it and read it again, I still don't know what he's saying. So. Uh, that's quite impressive, actually, that um, as Prime Minister and, and uh, leader of the government through to the election, at least, uh, certainly not beyond, um, uh, Mr English hasn't lost his ability to spend a long time saying nothing at all. And that's actually quite appropriate. That's actually quite appropriate. Um, thank you for uh, those comments, the, uh, the new Minister from Hamilton, uh, which does deserve a mention. Um, <laughs> they, they, they actually haven't done anything um, to talk about. And so uh, I guess saying again things that they're going to do in the future um, falls into the same vein. Um, it's all sort of smoke and mirrors, uh, Mr Speaker. And um, when, when we talk about uh, what the Prime Minister states, with, about his agenda, what he's going to do, what his government's going to do, what he wants to do, um, we hear the same old refrain that National have been repeating over and over for as long as I can remember, actually, Mr Speaker. Long before I joined New Zealand First, long before I became an MP, long before I came into this House, I heard um, the Prime Minister from the other side, um, talking about being aspirational. And it's aspirational this and aspirational that. And Well, that's a great thing to be, but it seems to be a bit of a mirage. We seem to be getting ever, ever closer to it, but never actually arriving. And that, I think, uh, Mr Speaker, is because this government, as I said, never does anything. It, it talks about uh, wanting a better future for New Zealand and wanting a brighter future, wanting a bigger, more bustling economy. But they never do anything about it. And a case in point, looking out my office window just before I came down, uh, Mr Speaker, I see a wharf filled with logs. Now, if, if a government was truly aspirational for a country like New Zealand, which has a huge forestry resource, we wouldn't have a wharf full of logs. We might have a wharf full of plywood, uh, a wharf full of particle board, a wharf full of pre-nailed trusses, a wharf full of processed timber products that were being exported to foreign countries. But no, we, we see a wharf full of logs because the government is insufficiently aspirational that it still allows that sort of thing to happen, Mr Bennett. Uh, oh, look, Mr Bennett, I want us to have sawmills and processing plants and for those industries to occur in New Zealand, to employ New Zealanders, good jobs for real people. This is all private enterprise, Mr Bennett. It's all private enterprise. There's a difference, Mr Bennett, between free enterprise and free trade. And, and uh, when New Zealand First is uh, leading the government next time around, um, you will see this because we, we, will, we will show you the way forward. As, we've been, as our leader has been uh, prophesying for the last 20 something years, uh, there is a better way. And uh, the time has come, the time has come that that is going to be demonstrated. And if, if you sit there long enough, Mr. if you're lucky enough uh, to, to come back next time, if the good people of Hamilton return you as the representative, and who knows, they might, um, now, that, now that you're, uh, you're making them famous by giving them a minister for the, the first time in, in decades, um, uh, you'll be privileged to watch while. Uh, while well, the Right Honourable Winston Peters leads a government that puts these plans into action, um, <laughs> Mr Speaker. Um, <clears throat> so, so, I mean, logs is, logs is simply one example. Um, members uh, on both sides actually have made mention of, of housing. Of course, the, the government members haven't spoken about it very much. 
um, because they don't want to acknowledge the crisis. Now, a, a government that was truly aspirational and had plans and had vision would probably turn the clock back to about 1930 and actually just start building some houses. Because if you don't have enough houses, the answer to that problem is to build more houses. It's all well and good saying, well, we'll let the market decide and we'll, and we'll carve off these special areas and we'll make it easier for developers to move in and build houses and so forth. And, and they seem to have this, this strange idea that if, if you put some land aside, the developers will move in and build cheap houses for poor people. Well, no, of course they won't. I mean, why would they? Uh, the same thing happened in Nelson. It's happening in Nelson right now. There's a, a block of waterfront land that's been put aside for affordable housing. And the developers have moved in and they're building half million dollar apartments. Because they can. Because the thing is about the free market, uh, Mr Speaker, is that when there is a demand for something, suppliers will supply that demand. And when there is no limit on who can come in and who can buy houses and how many houses they can buy, and they have access to virtually unlimited money, they'll pay whatever the developers want. And why would a developer say to himself or herself, well, I'm going to go and build 100 low-cost houses when I can build 100 high-cost houses instead and still sell them? So an aspirational government would put some rules in place around who can come into the country and buy houses with their unlimited money and who can't. And then the aspirational government would turn around, as in, in fairness the first Labor government did in the 1930s, and say, well, we have a problem with people who don't have enough houses, we will build some. And they plucked some money out of thin air, as this parliament has the authority to do, and they built houses. And then they rented them to people over years and years and years and paid back that expenditure. That's the kind of thing that an aspirational government that actually has a plan does, Mr Bennett. And, and it does other things too. It, 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 it extracts value from the products that this country produces. And it does that in a number of different ways. It does that through not restricting enterprise, but by directing trade in, in ways that make it more profitable um, both for the country and for the private businesses that generate that wealth. And we can't get away from the fact, we should never ever get away from the fact, that the resources that are extracted from this country are extracted for the most part by private enterprises, by farmers, by miners, by foresters, by fishers, and sold to the world. But they're sold into a, a market that is a, um, a fierce jungle kind of a place out there. And it needs some rules around it. It needs some rules to make it work in our favour. And, uh, and an aspirational government would, would look at the products and the resources that this country has and the way that it sells them to the world. And it would look around at, at, at putting some rules in um, and some assistance to New Zealand businesses to make sure that they were extracting the most money out of them possible. Government, a government that had aspiration could do this uh, off its own bat from the very start by looking at, say, the royalty regime that this country charges for the products that we export. Our oil, for example, it's one of our biggest export earners. Yet New Zealand's oil royalty regime is about the cheapest in the world. Saudi Arabia charges about between 50 and 85 per cent royalty on its oil. New Zealand charges between 1 per cent and 5 per cent. Why are we giving this wealth away? The, the, next, um, the next great gold rush, um, for, for want of a, of a better description, Mr Speaker, may well be fresh water. And New Zealand has a fresh water resource, as we know, um, that is incomparable in the world. At the moment, that water is allowed to be exported from this country by anybody who has a permit to extract it, with no return at all to the country that supplies it. So New Zealand First, because we are truly aspirational and do actually have some plans for the future, is saying that when, ex when water is exported from this country, it should command a royalty paid uh, to the Crown on behalf of the people who own it. Well, we haven't set any numbers, Mr Bennett, but we certainly will. Well, as, as, a, as, okay, as a comparison, if we said, for example, 10 cents a litre, that would make our water worth about, to, to the government, to the nation, about $16 a barrel in terms of an oil equivalent. Um, and, and if you say that uh, you know, Saudi Arabia is charging 50% royalty for its oil at the moment, they're getting about 25 bucks. So that's quite comparable, uh, you know, sort of $16 against, for, for, for water against 20, 25 bucks for oil. And ask yourself, which is actually more valuable? I mean, you can live without a barrel of oil, but can you live without water? The people who are buying this water are buying it because they haven't got it themselves and they can't get it. We have it in huge quantities, and yet we're giving it away for nothing. And the rest of the world is looking at us and saying, you're silly, why are you doing that? So New Zealand First Government will not be doing those sort of things. We will be extracting the value that exists in the resources and wealth that this country has and bringing it back into this country, bringing it back into this country for the benefit of the nation, for the benefit of its people. And the good news is, the good, the good news is, Mr Speaker, that a new order is sweeping the world. We've seen it with Brexit, we've seen it with Trump. It will happen here in New Zealand. There is an exciting leader with a vision, there is an exciting leader with a vision who will go forward after the next election and take this country to the great heights 
that it deserves, and that is the Right Honourable Winston Peters, and he'll be there after September leading his Zealand First Government. Thank you, Mr Speaker.